Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Pam Popper and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And so we're going to start off uh, with an announcement as usual, fall semester a month away. I cannot believe we're a month away from fall semester. It just cannot be that the summer is almost over. But anyway, in about four weeks it starts. Uh, we're going to offer the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course. We're going to offer statistics and biology and psychology and nutrition and obesity and all kinds of interesting classes. So if you'd like a calendar, email me. If you want to talk about our special package so you can take our four most popular certification courses, let me know. And um, uh, just send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. We can set up a time to chat about your career aspirations or whatever it is you think you'd like to do in terms of knowing more and doing more with um, information about informed medical decision making and plant based nutrition. So let's talk about vitamin D. You're probably thinking, do we have to talk about vitamin D once a month? Yes, we do, because we still have everybody coming in here, not everybody, but most everybody, uh, either with, um, they've been told by a health professional to take vitamin D, or um, they are taking vitamin D because a health professional told them to. So we have a lot of untraining to do, which is why I keep bringing up the topic. So in this particular study that I'm going to cover today, Researchers enrolled 230 postmenopausal women. Their vitamin D levels were between 14 and 27, and the women were told, first of all, to consume 600 to 1400 milligrams of calcium per day, and then they were placed on a placebo or a low dose of vitamin D, that was 800 international units per day, or a high dose of vitamin D, that was 50,000 international units two times per month. Now the women who were taking those high doses of vitamin D were given even more vitamin D as needed in order to keep their D levels above 30, which is said to be, said to be, big you know, uh, emphasis there, a level to be optimal by some health professionals. So the, the key was to see if you got vitamin D levels up to 30 or higher, did it make a difference in health outcomes? Well, after a year, calcium absorption increased by 1% for the women who got the higher dose of vitamin D, decreased by 2% for the women who got the lower dose, and decreased by 1.3% in women taking placebo. But there were no differences. In other words, when we stop fooling around and messing around with blood levels of this and test results for that, what did the health outcomes look like? No difference in bone density, no difference in muscle function, muscle mass, falls, fractures, or health assessment scores. So who profited from this? People who make vitamin D? People who do lab testing, people who prescribe vitamin D. Those are the people who profited, not the patients. So here's what the authors wrote. We found no data to support experts' recommendations to maintain serum vitamin D levels of 30 or higher in postmenopausal women. So now we have hundreds of studies, and every few weeks I cover another one. And we're just adding these all to the Health Brace Library, study after study after study, that shows that the vitamin D supplementation industry is not helping patients. I mean, the reason for medical intervention is to have a better health outcome, not to have, as I mentioned earlier, pretty blood test results and to make vitamin, supplement, vitamin and supplement makers or drug makers wealthier. So here's what I advise you to do. Tell your doctor you do not want to be tested for vitamin D. If your doctor orders such a test without your permission, tell your doctor you're going to ignore the results. I have an even better suggestion. Tell your doctor that from this point forward, you're going to be visiting only when you have symptoms and need some type of diagnostic advice. You won't be coming back other than that. And then you won't have to be subjected to vitamin D testing or whatever the medical industry dreams up next to tell everybody about. I mean, about uh, two, three, four years ago, I was putting out messages every few days on omega-3. That was sort of the fashionable thing. Now it's vitamin D. I know there's something else coming. We just don't know yet what it is. All right, so now let's talk about low fat versus low carb. This is a discussion that goes on and on. The advocates of the high protein, high fat diets, eating lots of animal foods, well, they defend their positions by reporting that studies have compared low fat diets to low carb diets, and uh, they can point to a study that says the low, uh, the low carbohydrate eaters did better than the low fat eaters. Well, what these people are hoping is that when they reference such a study, you're not going to go back and read the study and ask some important questions like, well, how low was the fat intake in the low fat group? Was it significantly different than the high fat group? What were those low fat eaters eating? I'll tell you what, beer is fat free, but I don't, I don't think it's a health promoting food. Dairy products can be fat free and still increase your risk of cancer. Um, how long were the subjects followed? A lot of times short term 
results don't mean much. Who funded the research? Conflicts of interest. What were the differences between the groups? Was it really statistically significant only, or was there actually some meaningful difference? And I'll get to what this has to do with a study I'm going to talk about as I go through this. So one study concluded that low-carbohydrate diets were more effective for both weight loss and improving markers for cardiovascular health than low-fat diets. So the study participants were 148 obese men and women who didn't have cardiovascular disease or diabetes, and they were randomly assigned to eat either a low-carbohydrate diet, that was um, defined as less than 40 grams of carbohydrate a day, so these were really big protein and fat eaters, or a low-fat uh, or a low-fat diet defined as less than 30% of calories from fat and less than 7% of calories from saturated fat. Now, both groups got some dietary counseling, and, um, and then data were collected on cardiovascular risk factors, weight, diet, uh, the dietary composition, uh, both at baseline, and then measured at 3, 6, and 12 months. All right, so here's what happened. At 12 months, um, 5.6 kilograms of weight loss in the low-carb group, 1.4 kilograms in the low-fat group. Fat mass, 2.6% loss of fat in the low-carb group, 0.4% in the low-fat group. Now, it's hard to read numbers, so I'm just going to give you the gist of it here. Triglycerides went down a little more in the low-fat, um, or in the low-carbohydrate group. And the ratio of HDL to, H uh, to LDL cholesterol got better in the low-carb group versus the uh, low-fat group. Researchers reported that one limitation of the study was the lack of clinical cardiovascular disease endpoints, but there are a lot of other things wrong with this study too, and I'm going to tell you about them now. First, neither group was eating a health-promoting diet, and let me explain what I mean by that. Telling people to try to limit their fat consumption to 30% or less of calories, um, that's not the level of fat reduction that is, um, that's recommended by me and other people in my camp who suggest that people eat a low-fat plant-based diet. We're talking about 15% or less of calories from fat. So when a study reports or researchers report that reducing fat to 30% doesn't improve health outcomes, that's like saying that reducing speed from 90 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour doesn't improve uh, survival rates in car crashes. Therefore, speed doesn't matter when we're setting traffic laws. Okay, well, that's ridiculous. Obviously, speed matters, but you've got to reduce speed more than 90 to 80 miles an hour if you're going to hope that people are going to survive a crash. Um, now, going back to our comparison groups here, fiber intake was almost identical between the groups, um, 15 grams a day. Woefully inadequate. It means that neither group was eating much in the way of plant food, fruits, vegetables, that sort of thing. Well, we know that the, uh, the, the low-fat eaters uh, or the low-carbohydrate eaters weren't. They were eating mostly protein and fat. But if you're eating um, a, a low-fat diet and, and you're only taking in 15 grams of fiber a day, my gosh, you must be living on processed junk food. Okay, That's the only way you could do it and keep your fiber intake that low. Um, the weight loss results, less than impressive. So I converted this to pounds. So the low-carb dieters lost an average of 12.32 um, uh, of, uh, pounds, 3.08 uh, pounds for the low-fat dieters all right, in one year. So yes, there was a lot more weight loss in the, in the uh, low-carb eaters. Um, but let me tell you this. A person who's obese should lose a couple pounds a week, one to two pounds a week, on a health-promoting diet. So if you take these low-carb eaters, instead of losing between 52 and 104 pounds in a year, they lost 12.32 pounds. The miserable outcomes, all right? Um, this, so, so neither group did very well on weight loss. And as for the improvements in HDL cholesterol and HDL to LDL ratio, meaningless number, okay? We've seen drugs that have been uh, gone through clinical trials that improve HDL levels. And they never made it to market because the cholesterol, HDL cholesterol went up, but the patients were dying faster. Hormone replacement therapy for menopausal women, that was supposed to increase HDL levels. It did. Also more women dying of heart attacks. Then we had fish oil raises HDL cholesterol. Uh, no difference in outcomes. Increased risk of cancer can't be ruled out. So that's a meaningless number in terms of health improvement. So what this study really shows is that it's not that a low-carb diet's better. It's that when you take people and you randomize them to consume one of one or the other diet, they're both bad, you're gonna nobody gets better. All right. And and so what we have here is statistical significance 
but not meaningful difference. And I picked that up, by the way, from Hole, Colin Campbell's most recent book, Hole. He talks about that. So if you're obese and you lose 12 pounds at the end of a year, you're still obese. If you're obese and you lose 104 pounds at the end of the year, depending on your starting point, you may be normal weight. We've got to stop fooling around with tiny changes that aren't statistically significant. And then everybody complains that people aren't motivated to try and do better for themselves. Well, when you work hard at something for a whole year and your health doesn't really improve much, you know, no wonder you're not all geeked up about doing it again. All right, well, that's all for today. Take home point, forget the vitamin D. Take home point, low carb diets are not better than low fat diets. And uh, more to come on Thursday. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.